Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight for PRS Grand Rounds on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Chad Purnell, and I'm one of the PRS resident ambassadors, and I'm joined remotely by my co-ambassadors, Shuja Shafkat from Fox Chase Cancer Center and Jordan Fry from NYU. Um, tonight, our topic on PRS Grand Rounds is going to be the surgical management of lymphedema. And this is going to be presented by Dr. David Chang, who is the professor and the chief at uh, the uh, University of Chicago Division of Plastic Surgery, and uh, also the current president of ASRM. So uh, we'd really like to welcome you to PRS Grand Rounds. So in order to follow along and to read uh, about lymphedema and surgical management of lymphedema after the presentation, you can join us at prsjournal.com, and you can also look at archived videos from PRS Ground Rounds on prsjournal.com as well. Um, and remember to follow along on Facebook as well. So uh, this year, PRS Grand Rounds was the winner of an Eddie and Ozzy Award for the uh, best use of a single social platform. And uh, we'd really like to thank all of our presenters from this year. and. Uh, Dr. Rorick and the journal and uh, our publisher for helping us uh, really put this project together. And uh, it's really been a resounding success. We've had thousands and thousands of views on uh, every single one of these videos. And so we're really proud of this and uh, we're looking forward to continuing it in 2018. Um, so once again, thanks. And I'd like to remind everyone that there's a Q&A period that immediately follows the presentation. So ask, com ask questions or post your comments right in the live feed underneath this video, and uh, we'll make sure to relay those questions to Dr. Chang. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Chang. Okay. Thank you, Chad. Uh, it's uh, my real pleasure to uh, participate in today's PRS Grand Round. The topic, as mentioned, is on surgical treatment of lymphedema. Uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, as you all know, lymphedema is a debilitating problem, often caused secondary to treatment of cancer. Approximately 5 million Americans suffer from lymphedema, and globally, about 250 million people suffer from lymphedema. It is expected that the incidence of lymphedema is likely to increase because these various uh, independent, independent factors that are related to lymphedema, such as obesity, the use of radiation therapy, and the age, continue to increase. Now, we don't know a lot about lymphatic system and lymphedema, but I'll share with you some of the few things that we do know. Anatomically, lymphatic system is similar to other vascular system. In there, there are lymphatic capillaries in the dermis, and there are lymphatic vessels in the subcutaneous tissue. There are also lymphatic vessels between the muscles in a deep layer, and they all eventually drain uh, into subclavian veins in the neck. Now, one thing that a lot of people may not know about lymphatic uh, system is that it is a dynamic system. There are uh, smooth muscle cells within the lymphatic uh, vessel that actively contract and pushes the lymphatic fluid distal to proximally. This is an important study that was published in PRS in 1996 by Isao Koshima and his group, looking at the cross-section of lymphatic vessels. As you can see, there are three layers. There is the uh, endothelial lining, and there is a, a media with the smooth muscle cells, and there is the adventitial layer also with the smooth muscle cells. This is a uh, cross-section of a lymphatic vessel in a patient who has lymphedema. As you can see, there has been destruction of endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells. And here, these illustrations demonstrate the progression of the damage of the lymphatic vessels in patients uh, with lymphedema. Now, currently, surgical treatment of lymphedema can be divided into either excisional procedures or physiological procedures. Charles procedure is a commonly known procedure where we excise a tissue down to the muscle and then use skin graft. It is effective, however, the surgery is uh, uh, reserved for patients with the extreme uh, lymphedema. Now, liposuction can also be a very uh, effective tool 
or reducing lymphedema, particularly those with fatty deposits. But one thing that the patients must know is that uh, in order for liposuction to be effective, that they must wear compression garment pretty much around the clock uh, for the remainder of the life. If they take the garment off for an uh, extended period of time, lymphedema will recur. Lymphovenous bypass is one of the more commonly performed microsurgical procedures performed today. Essentially, you are diverting an obstructed lymphatic system into the open venous system. Our first publication was 1962 in a dog model where end-to-end uh, -end anosmosis of a groin lymphatic to small twig of the femoral vein was described. Currently, most microsurgeons who perform lymphovenous bypass use techniques similar to one that described by Koshima in the year 2000, where the lymphatic vessels in the uh, subdermal layer is anosmos to uh, venules uh, at a submillimeter level, uh, with the, uh, the rationale being that the venous pressure here is low, so there's a minimal uh, backflow. I first started doing a lymphovenous bypass in 2005, and uh, this is the first paper that I published in PRS in 2010, uh, demonstrating approximately 40% reduction in the excess volume uh, after about 12 months of uh, uh, lymphovenous bypass. One of the main uh, advances in lymphatic surgery has been the use of indocine green to help visualize lymphatic uh, vessels as well as to help identify the areas for the uh, bypass. This is an example of a lymphatic system using the indocine green uh, where the lymphatic system has not been damaged. This is an example uh, of a lymphedema patient with indocine green. Here's some lymphatic vessels that you see here, but then you don't see much here anymore except replaced by significant what we call dermal backflow, demonstrating dilated lymphatic capillaries. By visualizing this, you can uh, map out the lymphatic system and then identify where will be the best site for the bypass. Some examples of lymphatic vessels uh, looked under the microscope. Here's a fairly normal looking lymphatic vessel with a thin wall filled with lymphatic fluid. Here are two lymphatic vessels. They are still functioning, but you can see some mild damages that appear as the lymphatic vessel appear to be a little bit uh, corrugated. Here's a lymphatic vessel visualized with the isosulfan blue, which makes it very easy to identify the lymphatic vessel. Here is a little a video clip of lymphovenous bypass under the microscope. This is a background with a one millimeter uh, square. So this lymphatic vessel is maybe about 0 0.4 millimeter. You can see it's filled with lymphatic fluid. You can see coming out is uh, out of the end of the lymphatic vessel. What you should appreciate here is that here is the uh, end of a venule where there's no clamp and there is no backflow whatsoever. And then once the anosmosis is completed and when we perform the uh, milk test, as we'll see shortly, you will see that the vein filled in with the lymphatic fluid uh, uh, immediately. Here now you will see the milk test, you see the vein filled with lymphatic fluid uh, demonstrating the patency uh, of the uh, lymphovenous bypass. And the other ways you can demonstrate patency is here, you can see after the end-to-side anosmosis, uh, endocyne green going from the lymphatic vessel into the, uh, into the vein. And here's an example of end-to-side anosmosis with the isosulfan blue going from lymphatic through the anosmosis into the vein. And this is exact same for, uh, same pic image seen with the, uh, uh, with the uh, microscope uh, with the endocyne green, and here is with the end-to-end -end anosmosis, and here is with the endocyne green under the infrared mode uh, under the microscope. So this was published in PRS in 2013, my first 100 consecutive case of lymphovenous bypass. The, all the data collected prospectively showed about 40% reduction in uh, excess volume after about 12 months, similar to my first publication. Um, what we do know about lymphedema is that, that uh, many people have found the inflammation and fibrosis play a critical role in the pathophysiology of lymphedema, leading to activation and proliferation of CD4 
uh, and the T helper 2 cells promoting production of various cytokines and growth factors. So this is a study that I was involved in where we took the tissue uh, from the control, which is normal side, and then the tissue from the upper arm of the lymphedema side, and then we measured these various different factors. And then six months after the bypass, we again took the biopsy from the uh, 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 site adjacent to the initial biopsy and did the exact same analysis. And what you see here is that, as you would expect, in the control side, there was no change in these levels, either before or after the surgery. On the lymphedema side, you see there was an elevation of these factors before the surgery, but six months after, significant reduction of every factor, kind of demonstrating that lymphovenous bypass uh, not only improve uh, symptomatology of lymphedema, but also helps improve pathologic changes in the skin. And this was published in the Lymphatic Research and Biology in 2015. I just want to remind the audience to ask questions in the comments on this Facebook Live video throughout the lecture, uh, and then there will be a Q&A uh, period immediately following the lecture. Now, another uh, means of treating lymphedema has been the uh, vascular lymph node transfer. The first publication was in 1979, again in PRS, in a rat model. The the, the hypothesis behind how the vascular lymph node transfer uh, works, uh, are there are two different types of thoughts, and one is that when you transplant lymph nodes uh, into the site, through the process of lymphangiogenesis, the lymphatic, uh, new lymphatic uh, network will develop. The second hypothesis is that, especially if you put the lymph nodes to the distal to the uh, extremity, it will work as a sponge to uh, uh, absorb the excess lymphatic fluid and then bypass into the venous system, essentially creating a, a pump mechanism. And it is possible that the both mechanisms work simultaneously. Currently, the most common areas for the, the source of vascular lymph nodes include the groin, the thoracic area, and the neck, and more and more uh, commonly, the, uh, the omentum and mesenteric nodes uh, are being utilized as well. The one thing that uh, we have to be cautious when we are starting to harvest lymph nodes is that we do not cause any secondary lymphedema from the donor site. So this is a very uh, excellent study, again published in PRS in 2012 out of Finland, uh, where 13 patients had growing lymph nodes harvested. None of them developed clinical lymphedema. However, when the lymphocytography was done, and the transport index were measured, many of these patients had to reduce lymphatic function at the site where the lymph nodes were removed, even though clinically they were not apparent. And this is another study that was uh, published out of the France in another journal there where the many patients who had had uh, lymph nodes harvested uh, resulted in the donor site complication, including secondary lymphedema. This is one of the reasons why I uh, favor taking lymph nodes from the supraclavicular area, which I described in the PRS in 2013, uh, based on the trans of the cervical area in the vein. And this was the first case where I actually performed this procedure of a patient with a severe lymphedema of the right leg, almost 200% uh, larger than the other side. It was not a candidate for lymphovenous bypass procedure. So here, uh, initially, I took a skin paddle with it as a lymph node with the skin paddle, and uh, you can see the uh, endosanguine injecting the lymphatic system, and the lymph node lymph nodes uh, lighting up, transferred to the uh, transfer to the anterior uh, ankle, and just in a short time, without doing anything else, significant reduction in the uh, volume and the softening of the leg. Uh, now this procedure has evolved. This is how I typically do my marking. I don't use the skin pedal much anymore because I found that in my experience approximately 25% of the time that the skin pedal is not that reliable. So here is the clavicle. I make the skin incision along the natural skin folds just above the clavicle between the sternocleidomastoid and the external jugular vein. So incision is about 3 to 4 centimeters no, and no more. It's very limited. And then, uh, this is after the lymph nodes are harvested with surrounding adipose tissue, 
uh, with the transverse cervical artery and the vein as the vascular pedicle. And the donor side scar looks kind of like this in most patients. Uh, very difficult to see, heals very nicely. And this was published in the Journal of Surgical Oncology a couple years ago, uh, it actually last year, 2016, looking at 100 consecutive cases. I was essentially looking at the flap complications uh, and the donor side complications. Uh, I, we explore three cases. I monitor all my lymph nodes. Even when I buried them, I put implantable Doppler. Fortunately, we were able to salvage all of them. I've had a, a couple of chylix at the time. I have a few more since. I've had some wound infections. So far, I have not had any secondary lymphedema develop. And now I have close to or ex exceeding 200 cases of uh, supraclavicular lymph node transfer. So the donor sites usually heals very nicely. I, I, these are some examples. Again, the right side uh, incisions. This is the left side. And the another flap that I, uh, I like to use uh, quite uh, a lot is the lateral thoracic lymph nodes, and I combine it with the muscle sparing latissima C dorsi. And the, uh, this is the, was published in the Journal of Surgical Oncology, uh, looking at the outcome. Uh, if you place them, for example, like into the axilla or groin where there's a lot of scar tissue, once the scar is released, you, you will see some improvement right away, but then the improvement kind of plateaus. After about a year or later, as the lymphangiogenesis develops, you will continue to see the improvement in the, uh, uh, improvement in the uh, measurements. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, a lot of patients who present lymphedema also appear with the absence of breast following mastectomy, and they also have radiation in many of these patients. For these patients, the combined breast reconstruction lymph node transfer uh, have become popular. First publication of this uh, uh, approach was uh, in the Annals of Surgery in 2012 by the, the Finnish group, where we combined the well-described DIP flap with the lymph nodes based on the superficial cervical flex iliac vessels. And you take the abdominal flap to reconstruct the breast, and then you place the lymph nodes into the axilla, uh, into the thoracodorsal vessels. So here's an example of a patient uh, who had had mastectomy, radiation, now significant lymphedema. So here is a single profile DIP flap that's been harvested with lymph nodes based on the superficial cervical flex iliac vessels. Here is in the abdomen, the flap, lymph nodes. This is on the chest. A uh, flap is placed, a deep system is placed into the internal mammary and I NS most internal mammary vessels. Then I shape the breast and then I put lymph nodes into the axilla and then connect the lymph nodes into the thoracodorsal vessels as needed. So this was published in the uh, Annals of Surgical Oncology, uh, I believe 2015, of my first 29 consecutive patients. We were able to show 47% mean reduction in the volume differential at 12 months. Able to perform simultaneous breast reconstruction lymph node transfer at the same time. So this is my current option, somewhat simplified. So I think lymphovenous bypass uh, alone can be effective in early cases of upper extremity. For patients with the absence of breast, uh, combining with lymph node transfer is a good option. For majority of other patients, I often offer both combined lymph node transplant, particularly supraclavicular lymph node transplant, with the lymphovenous bypass, and I have found this to be an effective approach in most of my patients. For extreme cases, I do offer a debulking procedure such as Charles procedure, and I do offer uh, liposuction in selected cases, particularly in cases where these physiologic procedures have been performed but there are, some, there are some areas where patient can benefit from limited liposuction. One thing that is important for patients to understand is that currently, unfortunately, there is no cure for lymphedema. And none of the procedures that we describe actually will cure lymphedema in most of these cases. However, I do think that it does improve the severity of lymphedema in most cases. It does help reduce complications such as cellulitis, in many of the patients, and that it does improve quality of life 
in the majority of the patients. It has limitations. Uh, lymphedema uh, treatment is still evolving. Many people are coming up with the better ideas, better ways to treat lymphedema, and it is a very exciting time. There's a lot of research going on to address many of these questions that we still don't have answers for. Financial factor is a big factor. Uh, some of the insurances don't cover some of these procedures. Uh, currently, unfortunately, there's no ideal solution. Even after surgery, most patients still will have to do compression and wear garments. Uh, currently, I would say that the best solution is a prevention and early intervention. So this is an example of a patient which kind of illustrates how lymphedema can uh, limit patient's life. When she had lymphedema such as this, she could not wear pants. She could not go hiking. She could not walk. She couldn't even wear shoes. Even though I did a debulking procedure, it resulted in a significant improvement in her life. And this is what we're looking for. We're hoping that one day we'll be able to help uh, transform this patient's life into somewhat of a normalcy. Just a little plug for those people who want to learn more about lymphedema. Uh, we will be hosting the 7th World Symposium on Lymph Lymphedema Surgery here at University of Chicago in springtime when the snow have thawed. So uh, I would uh, like to invite all of you to join us. Thank you very much. Great. So we, we've got a lot of questions coming in from Facebook. Um, and so uh, I'll start with one from Erez Diane. And uh, they're asking, thank you for the great talk, Dr. Chang. When you're performing a vascularized lymph node transfer, do you prefer to place the nodes proximal or distal in the extremity? Yeah, so I think the location uh, does play a role. What I do is when I examine the patient's arm or the leg, let's say, let's say leg, if the entire leg is involved, then I would put lymph nodes proximally, and then I will do the uh, lymphovenous bypass distal. I find that lymphovenous bypass works very quickly and uh, allows the lower uh, part of the leg to be reduced while we're waiting for lymph nodes to uh, work uh, through lymphangiogenesis, which could take a long time, especially in the leg. It could be one to two years. Now, if the lymphedema is limited to, say, like ankle and the foot, and the remainder of the leg is okay, then I have placed them distally into the ankle area or even to the knee area uh, where the, uh, and I found them to be very effective as well. So I think both works. The, uh, the dilemma of putting into the wrist area or to the ankle area, particularly when you have a bulky lymph node transfer is that it gives you, it causes a deformity which many patients really do not like and then you have to come back and, and then debulk them. And uh, uh, so uh, that's one of the issues, particularly in the Western uh, patients. So one thing that we want to add is make sure that um, if you want to read more articles about lymphedema, please go to prsjournal.com, and we have an article collection uh, that you can read there. And uh, keep sending in your questions. So. We, we've had multiple people ask about counseling patients preoperatively. Yes. So um, I'll, I'll give you kind of a representative question. So uh, from Nikki Phillips, <coughs> she says, uh, how do you discuss the limitations of treatment with patients in the uh, preoperative period in order to set appropriate expectations? Yeah, I think that's very, very important. Uh, even today, I saw several lymphedema patients who I turned away because they need to understand that the, the surgery, uh, currently at least, uh, in most patients, will not be a cure. Mm -hmm. And that the best they can expect is, in, in many cases, is the uh, improvement in the quality of the, uh, the arm or the leg. You will become softer or become lighter. And that, unfortunately, I, I really cannot tell them, foretell them, that whether they are going to have a significant improvement or not. What I, to, what I, way I explain to them is that it is like a bell curve. There are patients that are one extreme, they're going to do very well. I saw a patient today who I operated over a year ago. She doesn't even wear a garment anymore. And it went down over 50%. She's ecstatic. And she's very active. She's a nurse. So she, does not, she cannot wear a garment because she's always washing her hands. And she enjoys outdoor activities like scuba diving. And she's able to do all that. On the other hand, I have patients on the other extreme 
where I think I did the best I could. But then the uh, lymphedema really hasn't gone down that much. And they still have to wear garments, and they're very disappointed. Well, most patients, I would say 80, 90 percent, will notice some improvement of varying degree. And that I can say, because I, I have seen that in my patients, and I have collected data to show that. But that's how I exp explain to them. And you just have to be totally honest with them. I'm not trying to sell them the surgery. I want them to understand that it can help them, but it is a one of the tools they can use in combination with all the other things. If they're obese, they have to lose weight. They have to change their lifestyle in, ter in terms of exercise and diet. They have to continue to see a lymphedema therapist, make sure they have the right kind of garment, make sure they uh, are careful not to uh, cut their arm or the leg to avoid the infection. All those things are very, very important. So I explain all this to the patient, and if they still want to proceed with it, then then we can uh, we can then consider the surgery. Otherwise, then they really should not have surgery. If they're expecting a cure or miracle or a or just not able to wear the garment, I think that is a little bit unrealistic, and I'll tell them so. So here's a question from Walter Joseph. So. Uh, he's asking, whenever you're using ICG lymphangiography prior to a lymphaticovenous bypass, what's your criteria for choosing a good lymphatic? Uh, meaning, do you try to avoid robust lymphatic vessels, or are you okay with taking them for an estimosis? Yes, this is a good question. So, in fact, I have an entire talk on this. So, when I do the ICGN, you, the beauty of it is you can map it out. And you will see the lymphatic vessels, some of them actually go all the way into axilla without any disruption. Now, I'm not going to bypass those. Those are working fine, so why would I bypass that? What I see is, what I'm looking for is, I'm looking for lymphatic vessels that travel certain di distance, and then it goes into a gigantic dermal backflow. You know that it's not working anymore. Those are the ones I bypass. I am concerned that if I bypass too much, too much especially normal lymphatics, that I may actually uh, cause them a harm. You know, it's like having a, a traffic jam. If the traffic's flowing fine, why would you go out and, and repair anything? In fact, you could actually make it worse. So I'm very selective about where I bypass and how many I bypass. So in fact, I think with the use of Indosign Green, uh, I may, number of bypasses I perform have actually may have gone down. Uh, whereas before, I would just randomly and try to bypass as many as possible. So speaking of ICG, uh, Juan Carlos Perez is asking, if you don't have Indosign Green at your hospital, do you have any recommendations for an alternative? Well, so, you know, um, the, some countries don't have the machine because of the various the, the regulations or uh, import-export uh, issues. And uh, I know that there are some people in the other countries, they actually make them. Uh, Indosign Green is a common, common uh, product that most hospitals have because ophthalmologists use it, cardiac surgeons use it. So I, I think they're very easy to get. It's the machine that they're talking about. The machine is pretty, uh, and I, I know there, uh, actually, Aries Diane gave a talk on that at an ASPS meeting, how to make your own machine. So you can consider making your own machine. Um, otherwise, before ICGN, what I technique I used to use was the use of isosulfone blue. When you in inject them into the web spaces, and if you do have a, a functional lymphatic vessels, you will go into lymphatic vessels, and uh, lymphatics will turn blue. It makes it very easy to identify, but you will not be able to map it. You will not be able to see them except under the microscope after you make an incision. So it is not as useful like ICGN, which you can see before you even start the surgery. Um, so next question is from Mohammed Al-Fahar, and uh, he's asking, what do you think about vascularized lymph node transfer for filariasis? Um, so I have not had experience with filariasis. <laughs> As many lymphedema patients I've ever seen, there are a few patients who have traveled from elsewhere. I've seen patients from the Middle East. I've always performed the, uh, the test to see if they have parasite. I have not had anybody who, 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 who uh, turned up positive. Um, but I guess if they have lymphedema fluoriasis, first thing is you have to treat the parasite. You have to kill them off uh, with the, you know, the medication. And then I guess you would then you would then uh, perform the procedures in a similar fashion. And uh, while I don't have experience with it, I do uh, hear from my uh, uh, friends 
uh, from the areas where filet rice is endemic, then lymph node transfers uh, can be effective. So uh, that's I, th I think it can be uh, it can be uh, performed. So this is a question from Farooq Shahzad. He's asking, uh, do you ever use groin lymph nodes for vascularized lymph node transfer? And if so, how do you ensure that you don't cause donor site lymphedema? Yeah, so when I'm doing a combined breast reconstruction with a DIP flap, I use groin lymph nodes. But I use a technique like many people do. I use the reverse mapping. So I will inject the patient with technetium, radio technetium, either day before or early in the morning. And then I, I do what breast surgeons do or melanoma surgeons do. I use gamma, gamma probe to identify the hot nodes, and then I stay away from it. I, I take only no, lymph nodes that does not uh, develop, uh, is not detected or has a very low detection uh, with the uh, uh, gamma probe, so ensuring that I don't take any central nodes from the, uh, from the groin. So having done that way, uh, I really haven't had, I have not had any uh, secondary lymphedema develop in the leg using this technique, and I've, I've done quite a bit. So Francesco Egro is asking, um, many lymphatic venous bypass papers highlight the importance of post-op compression. How do we tease out if the improvement in these papers is due to a more strict regime for compression versus the bypasses themselves? A very good question. I think that's very important. If you uh, do a surgery and then do a, a aggressive, intensive therapy, that alone is going to make it better, even without a surgery, and, and I'm sure of it. So. Uh, um, what I do uh, is uh, after the bypass, I don't put them on Garmin, mainly because the compression garment is very tight and I'm afraid it's going to disrupt my bypass. So I just have them uh, wrap for about four weeks. And once the wound is healed, I tell them to wear the garment. But I tell them to go back to doing whatever was working for them in the, before the surgery. Nothing different. I do not start them on any new regimen. They do exactly the same thing that they were doing before. So... Uh, and I don't measure, I don't measure them first four weeks. It's useless. I will measure them earliest. I will measure them three months later, and then uh, a year later, so that uh, in the long run they are not doing anything different. In fact, many patients find that after bypass, that the need for compression garment goes down, so they stop wearing, like the patient I saw today. So uh, I would say, uh, from time to time, patients show up. They say they don't wear garment anymore. They don't. They find no need for it. So it is not due to wearing garments for therapy. Uh, but you have to be careful when you're a, a, uh, looking at your data and then particularly if you're uh, publishing or presenting it, that you're not sh uh, presenting data that's been skewed by uh, intensive therapy. Because even without any surgery, if patients just lay there and do nothing and get trapped all the time, arm or leg is going to go down a lot. So Ira Savetsky is asking, um, patient selection appears to be so critical for either a lymphatic venous bypass or a lymph node transfer. Who should be undergoing these procedures uh, with regards to mild, moderate, and severe lymphedema? Very good question. I wish I had an answer to that. So that's one of the things that uh, I'm looking at my data right now to see if there's any identifiable factor that I, we can tease out that when I see the patients, I can say, well, you know what, you have... You have this, this, and this, so you are a good candidate. You have this and this and that, you are a bad candidate. So far, I have not found that yet. Only thing I found is that, especially with lymphovenous bypass, and this was published before, is that uh, patients with the earlier lymphedema, not necessarily the, uh, the duration, but the earlier in terms of the severity, where they still have some functioning lymphatic vessels and minimal uh, tissue fibrosis, they do better. Because if you do lymphovenous bypass, you have to rely on lymphatic system to actively pump the fluid from lymphatic into the vein. So if your smooth muscles are not functioning anymore, connecting is not going to do anything. If you connect a static lymphatic vessel to a vein, it's not going to pump it up. So having those functioning lymphatic vessels is important. And also, if your tissue, arm or leg, is already fibrotic, if you bypass it, it's not going to really shrink down anymore. So those are the things that I know. So I think the, the patients where you still have some uh, functional lymphatic vessels, meaning mild lymphedema, they do better with the uh, lymphovenous bypass. And I think similarly, the same thing with lymph, lymph node transplant. So I think the earlier interventions are better. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I think they, uh, the results, I think, show that the uh, outcome is better. So, um, you know, in speaking with a lot of these people, we have a lot of different viewers. Um, some are physicians, and this video is also available to the general public. Um, so what do you think the general public should know about plastic surgeons and lymphedema and, uh, you know, how we can be involved in their care of these patients? Well, you know, plastic surgeons, many of plastic surgeons are microsurgeons. These lymphatic surgery that are uh, being performed uh, physiologically, meaning with not like liposuction, but lymph node transplant, lymphovenous bypass, uh, really is a very kind of uh, uh, very refined microsurgery. So I think it's it, when you are um, uh, seeking advice from plastic surgeons, uh, you probably should uh, see. Uh, whether they are, are uh, have experience in microsurgery, and also I think it's helpful now that the uh, with the information that's available uh, in the uh, internet uh, to read about the uh, these various different procedures, understand the uh, potential uh, complications. For example, the lymph node transplant, it could actually cause harm if it's not done carefully, and the lymphovenous bypass you will not be that effective unless it is done uh, in certain ways. So I think uh, patients need to understand the limitations of these procedures and also uh, understand that it is not, it is not a cure. There, it's not magical, but it can be helpful in many patients. Uh, there are things that the patients need to also understand that they can control. They need to uh, manage their weight. Obesity is one of the uh, key factors in developing lymphedema. So if patients are obese, they really should lose weight first before seeking surgery. And the compliance is very important. You have to wear a compression garment. You have to uh, uh, massage them. You have to invest time and effort in taking care of your limb. Uh, surgery alone is not going to be a solution if, you, if the patient does not participate in the care. So um, Erez Diane is asking, um, how do you manage patients that have lymphedema and they also have uh, concomitant uh, adipose hypertrophy, uh, the lipolymphedema patient? Well, I think the lymph, you know, lymphedema is one reason why they develop fat hypertrophy. It's one of the pathophysiology of it. So um, I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell. I mean, the extreme of a Another case where it's all fat hypertrophy is lipedema, which is something that I see time to time. Those patients, I don't offer uh, lymph node transfer LV bypass. Those patients need liposuction, and I, uh, and I will refer them to other surgeons who like to do them. Um, so there is a role for liposuction, and I do do them from time to time. But I firstly, usually first offer physiologic procedures first to see how much we can get it reduced. And uh, uh, in a selected cases, I may go ahead and do liposuction in a few spots here and there uh, to help finalize the uh, improvement. But it's very rare that I will use liposuction as my first, first choice. Um, you know, it's, it's another obstacle for uh, doing liposuction routinely, at least in the United States, is the uh, financial factor. Insurance won't pay for it. And, uh, uh, it is. It, it could be a financial burden for a lot of patients. Okay. Uh, Terry Kuti is asking, do many breast reconstruction and breast cancer patients have to travel to receive comprehensive lymphedema care? It seems extremely specialized to microsurgery. Well, if you are looking for combined uh, abdominal flap and the lymph node transplant, yeah, it, it does require microsurgery. But, you know, like... Abdominal flap, D flap, or muscle pain free tramp for breast reconstruction is not. It is not that uh, special anymore. Uh, almost any major city, even smaller cities where there are a lot of plastic surgeons, it is done very regularly. Uh, so I don't think it's very difficult to find surgeons with a DIP flap, and the now they may not have experience doing lymph node transfer. That's a different story, but uh, I think that if you leave it live within any kind of major metropolitan area, you should be able to find somebody. And, you know, since I started doing lymphatic surgery in 2005, 
Now there are many, many centers, many, many surgeons doing this type of surgery from East Coast to West Coast, from, uh, you know, from North to South. So I think uh, you should be able to find someone uh, with the experience and knowledge and skills to do these safely and effectively. So um, we have a question from, so th this is a, a comment uh, from Daniel Liu uh, saying that Dr. Chang makes an excellent point that lymphatic surgery remains a highly specialized um, area within the broad field of plastic surgery and it behooves patients to do their homework and check their surgeon's experience and develop realistic expectations along with participating in active pre-op and post-op physical therapy to achieve optimal outcomes. Thank you, Dad. And um, we have one more question here. So, yeah, one more question. So, uh, R.S. Libyan wants to know, uh, what advice do you have for surgeons uh, that are trying to get started in lymphedema surgery? And this will be our final question. Well, that's great. I think the more surgeons uh, are involved, the better. The more the merrier. The uh, you know uh, um, now there are there's plenty in the literature that you can read on. If you go to uh, PubMed and search lymphedema surgery, you will find numerous numerous articles every month in various different journals. So. Uh, I hope that you will go and uh, read them and try to learn that way. There are many, many symposiums now uh, that are being organized at various major centers you can attend throughout the year, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, globally. Most major meetings, including ASPS, ASRM, association meeting, have a lot of panels, instruction courses on lymphedema. Every major meeting you go to now has uh, lectures on these topics. So if you go to the meetings, sign up and go listen to these lectures. And I think that many surgeons welcome you to come and visit them. I, I know I do. If whenever somebody emails me and want to come and visit, watch me or whatever, you know, you can come anytime. No fees. Just, you know, you can come and just, you can spend uh, uh, time. And I know other doctors will do the same thing. So you can go visit the doctors that you may want to learn from and watch. That's how I found out about lymphedema surgery in the first place when I was visiting another surgeon uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, when I was a uh, uh, visiting professor, happened to watch lymphedema surgery. That's how I developed my interest. So we are all here to share our ideas and thoughts so that the others can also uh, help us develop a better solution. So, uh, you know, we are all here uh, for anyone who wants to uh, uh, learn from us. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks everyone for participating in uh, this December PRS Grand Rounds, uh, and thanks Dr. Chang. Uh, this has been a great talk, and uh, please remember to visit uh, our website at prsjournal.com and read our article collection about lymphedema and uh, learn more about these techniques.